one's life and claiming one's rights. So when we're talking about refugee women, there are a few things that we think are really crucial. One is economic empowerment, obviously, so that people are able, even if they become displaced and they end up in a new country or even are displaced within their own country, they are still able to sort of reclaim their lives and make livings for themselves and things like that. And there are different levels of empowerment all the way up to claiming one's rights. And one of the things that we want to focus on is getting refugee women to the point where they can become sort of political actors and get that seat at the table on all these big decisions that impact their lives very intimately. Um, so we examined all sorts of different things, like we've been saying, art, employment, education, and psychosocial support, because all of these things, I think you'll see, there's a lot of overlap between all of these initiatives that we're going to be talking about, and really looking at all of them together is what makes a difference for people. So for our first case study, I'm going to be talking about public art, and I'm going to be talking about an organization in Jordan that works with Syrian refugees. But a general background on public art, which is a topic that I'm interested in in general, so this is just some general background. Art, as we've been hearing about, you know, we heard about the quilting project, things like that, art in general can be sort of an individual personal healing process for people. Um, but public art is different. We're talking mainly murals and things like that. So it can facilitate intra and intercultural conversations. It can challenge dominant narratives. If somebody's story is not what the dominant narrative is and you paint a mural about it or you make a public exhibit, um, then that is a way to force people to engage with your story and reckon with your story. And in that same vein, um, it is a way to claim power and space. Sometimes people are displaced and they end up in this completely new place and the residents have already been there really don't want them there. Um, but you know, these women and these families are still going to be there. So having an area that you can say, I painted that, I worked with my community, I made that, it's a way to feel ownership of your area, of your physical space. And it's really important um, because in ideal cases, public art is more accessible to women as a way of facilitating conversations and sort of telling their stories than a lot of other things. If you know anything about sort of graffiti movements and things in the United States, you might know that there is a lot of gatekeeping. These things can still be very male dominated. Um, but in ideal situations, they are democratic. And women who may not have access to other avenues can participate in these things. So our case study is the Syrian Refugee Art Initiative. It's by a, um, an artist named Joel Artista. It started in 2013. This is in Jordan, working with Syrian refugees in Jordan. And the artist who he decided to, he works with different Syrian educators and things who are in, the, in, these, um, in these refugee areas. And he noticed that there was a lot of focus on things like food and water and shelter, which are obviously crucial. Um, but there was really, there, you know, there had been this crisis ongoing and there was really no creative outlet for these refugees, no, you know, sort of forms of expression for them. So he began working with different educators and community leaders and they put together all of these, and these are just from the website, these are like a tiny sample. There's all of this incredible art. Um, so it did a few things. This is a really successful example of public art doing what it does best. Um, one thing that happened was people were able to express themselves, to be a part of the community, but it also facilitated conversations between the Syrians and the Jordanians who had already been there in a way that just sort of like sitting at a table hadn't been as successful, but when they had these art, these art pieces to facilitate it, the conversations got easier. So that's one example. I think public art is a really fascinating thing, um, and if you're interested, again, the Syrian Refugee Art Initiative by Joel Artista, you can find more information about that. the benefits of art therapy, um, specifically for refugees who are living under um, extreme trauma. Um, and they're experiencing, they've experienced many human rights violations, gender-based violence, sexual violence, domestic violence. And art is a way for refugees to reconnect to their cultural roots 
um, to their traditions, their practices. It's a way for them to regain agency that's been injured during the time of flight. It helps also with transitioning, and many um, refugees are living in a state of limbo. So what was once what they once had is not accessible any longer, and what lies ahead is mostly unknown, and art gives them a way to um, heal and find some self-expression and to reconnect. Also, art comes at a low cost. So where funds are stretched and limited for basic survival needs, art can come in at a low cost with big benefits. So I'm going to talk about a project that was started by an artist named Hannah Rose Thomas. She traveled to Kurdistan, Iraq with a clinical psychologist to bring an art project to Yazidi women, refugees, who had escaped ISIS captivity. And here's some pictures of the self-portraits that she helped them create. Um, she, Hannah Rose Thomas says that these paintings convey the women's dignity, their resilience, and their unspeakable grief. Also, many of the women never went to school or learned to read or write, and this is their way through art to share their stories with the rest of the world. So Hannah teaches um, the women how to do the self-portraits. Um, she also um, brings, brings them um, a way to show their self-expression, um, to find healing and strength, and art is the, the way to do this. There's also other forms of art that have the same benefits, so music, dancing, um, drama, cooking, sewing, and it, they all have the same benefits. These portraits are, were done by Hannah Rose Thomas, and these are actual portraits of the Yazidi women who also did their own self-portraits. And in the exhibits, she hangs these alongside of their own self-portraits. And she believes that um, advocacy uh, is such a powerful tool to change media narratives and for these women to have a voice. Um, she, her most important goal is to bring a voice to the voiceless. And that's what she does with this artwork. Thank you. I did a two case study. One case study is from Russo, we, Iraq. We can't hear you. Oh. I did a two case study. One is Russo. And get closer. I did a two case study. <laughs> <laughs> I did a two case study. One case study is in Mosul, Iraq. Another one is from Syria. Trauma is a barrier to, to empowerment. So some women have to overcome it. And uh, one is when some women come to their salon, hair salon is in Mosul, Iraq. Why they go to the salon? One reason is they believe the salon's hair dryer. They believe hair dryers are the keeper, are the, are their secret uh, keeper. So they will tell their stories and their stories to these hair dryers. And uh, another reason is the um, in the absence of much in the ways of mental health health service for them. So they have tried to find a way to um, reduce the trauma. So the salon has uh, transferred into an official therapy group. So one of the few public place is a salon. So where women can gather among themselves to process the collective trauma of three years of terror. Many women lost their 
family members and friends um, after their ISIS occupation. So many women come and uh, tell their stories to these hairdressers. And uh, women, because in the public, women are required to wear black and uh, cover their hands in, in the gloves in the public. Unlike the public, in the salon, they have a way to say, speak out, to say what they want. They don't have to concern what men think of them. They can be their real um, identity. Unlike the public, because in public, um, cafe is dominant of men. Musou mm. is a fairly conservative with the city. Many cafes are the domain of men, so when women go outside, they have to stay with their family, especially their husband. Salon is a place um, to bring them a deep satisfaction about the real world, because they can have friends in that place. Here are two photos. The left side photo is from the Musso, Iraq. It's a woman we are very fashionable. She is going to get some help in the salon. You can see she is very happy and she works into the salon. And in the right side is a volunteer. It's a 20 years old girl that try to volunteer in a church to teach this refugee kids how to play violin. And another case study is in Syria, and it's actually it's in Turkey, Syrian refugee women in Turkey. So I reported by the International Medical Corporation, they did the, the research about the coping strategy. Coping strategies is a method to deal with trauma because people try to get, a, get a help. They try to build a social network. They try to uh, go outside. But um, also in their coping strategy, they have two sides. The positive side is the women, they try to get the social support. They talk with their family using their social network. On the another side is the negative one. Women will keep crying, smoking, sleeping, and then reject to talk with the public. It's very bad. So. Uh, my suggestion for the future is that women should suggest more women to join social group, to build their social network, not just stay alone. They need the social support. And also for some women, they are very nervous. They don't like to talk with the others, especially in the refuge. So, and the most of the refugee women, I, they have some um, experience, they should speak out and to let more people to know. So, and uh, if they can actively communicate with their family, their friends, even the public, I think that everyone hopes to help them. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna do this. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm going to speak a little bit about the role of employment and empowerment. Um, so in terms of uh, refugee uh, situations and refugee crises and uh, support systems for refugees, one of the most important aspects of that is um, economically and socioeconomically supporting them through employment opportunities and initiatives. Um, if you think about the experiences that many refugees go through, um, they had past careers, past livelihoods that are now taken away from them, and uh, many of them don't have uh, ways to feel like they are um, creating things, and that's so important to give back that sense of purpose to refugees um, in situations when they're being resettled, but also in camps. Specifically, the gendered component of employment and empowerment through employment uh, relates to the fact that many refugees are single mothers who no longer, uh, who are the only uh, breadwinners, right? So the, giving the opportunity for women to make money to be able to support their children and to support themselves is so crucial. 
as well, a lot of research has been done to show that women who are self-supporting are uh, less likely to be impacted by uh, sexual exploitation, sexual harassment, and the like. So that's just another lens. Um, so now we're going to dive into a specific uh, example of this initiative. Uh, which is the Anka Cooperative. It is based in southern Turkey, and basically the Anka Cooperative is a social enterprise, and their specific mission is to create self-empowerment for Syrian refugee women through creation of carpets and other traditional crafts. Um, so the Anka Cooperative uh, works with these Syrian refugees and trains them in Turkish carpet making. Many of you may be familiar uh, with that the Turkish carpets are uh, a luxury item and people spend a lot of money purchasing them. Um, so it's a really unique cooperative that's been developed and it's been very successful thus far. Um, and so they, they work in association with, wo with Woven Legends to train um, the Syrian refugees who are in um, Turkish refugee camps in training them to create these carpets and other crafts. Uh, one of the most crucial parts of um, the Anka Cooperative is the aspect of the fact that they are a fair trade initiative, uh, which means that um, not only are they just providing these women with employment opportunities, but they're making sure that that experience is fulfilling for the women, that it is a safe workspace, that it is um, an, you know, a pleasant place to be, it's social, so it also has that um, you know, therapeutic aspect in a lot of ways that we've been touching upon previously. And most importantly, it's fair compensation. The women who are working in the Anka Cooperative make as much as uh, Turkish weavers, which is crucial. Um, another point on this specifically is that there have been many initiatives in the past for refugee women where they are um, handicraft initiatives, where they are making soaps and uh, quilts and other such things, but unfortunately, there isn't often a market for these items, so it isn't actually um, a sustainable initiative. But um, this one, they have been able to really provide these women with a source of income, which has been tremendous. And it separates it from other uh, initiatives. The Anka Cooperative specifically works in the Adiaman uh, refugee camp, which is one of the largest refugee camps in Turkey. Um, it's only about 100 miles from the Syrian border, and it has over 30,000 inhabitants. So it's a very large camp. That being said, uh, refugee camps often um, are different than we imagine them to be in ways that this camp specifically has a lot of established infrastructure within it. It has electricity already and running water and the streets are paved. Um, so uh, the Anka Cooperative is able to employ um, already 225 women, which is amazing, within this refugee camp and they work in several other refugee camps in Turkey as well. Um, and the place of work is air conditioned and well lit and the women are treated extremely well which is important that it's not just about providing refugee women anyone with employment opportunities but making sure that those are positive and that there is dignity on every level. Um, so the Anka Cooperative has an ambitious yet achievable goal of empowering and educating over 20,000 refugees by the year 2020 which is amazing. Um, so they have a uh, mapped out strategic plan for growth as to how they're going to achieve this. They're going to expand their operations into other locations within Turkey, as well as uh, expanding to other products besides for just Turkish carpets. And um, they're also going to um, donate all the proceeds that they make through the Anka Cooperative. Um, and they're using that, all those proceeds to go back to achieving this goal of reaching 20,000 refugees by 2020. Um, the Anka Cooperative, um, I didn't actually get the chance to put the website up on the presentation, but uh, if you're able to purchase something from them, they um, sell the rugs online and they ship to the United States, um, so you're able to support the initiative. Um, but like I said, the empowerment aspect specifically with the Anka Cooperative, that they are fair trade, that the women are treated with dignity, and this gives them um, a lot of purpose in their lives, so it's a really incredible initiative. Thank you. So Sarah sort of outlined what I wanted to say regarding employment and how important it is that refugee women are employed and have ways of providing for themselves and their families. So I will be looking at the United States and how refugee women find employment there. 
So a couple brief statistics about the U.S. So in the year 2016, so two years ago, the U.S. admitted 84,995 refugees, which was the most in any year during the Obama administration. Of course, afterwards, the number has since then declined. Um, the highest number of refugees came from the Democratic Republic of Congo, followed by Syria, Burma, Iraq, and then Somalia. And the way that refugees are sort of settled depends on the states and the resources that they have, as well as the space. So oftentimes, um, the largest and most economically secure states like California, Texas, and New York tend to take in a lot of refugees. Um, in this case, um, those three states taking around 20,730 refugees. And that's actually a picture from a city in New York, which is sort of considered like the capital of refugees because it accepts so many refugees. It's Mirica, um, they're being naturalized, they have a lot of resources for them, they provide um, naturalization information, they provide you know, education, literacy training, things like that, which really helps refugees feel welcome and also um, feel like they're the part of the society that now that they're living in. So uh, uh, quick facts about employment. There are a lot of misconceptions about refugees when they come to the host country, that they take the resources, that they don't really contribute to society. But in fact, looking at how refugees um, work in America really dispel a lot of those stereotypes. For example, refugee men were more likely to work than U.S. born men at 67% versus 62%, um, while refugee women were as likely to work as their U.S. born counterparts. And in some cases, some refugee rates of employment actually exceed U.S. born women's rates. So, for example, Vietnamese and Ukrainian refugee women. So, as refugee experience in the U.S. increases, their income levels and rates of public benefit participation match that of the U.S. born population. And that sounds like a dry statistic, but it's really important because what it means is that refugees come and settle into their host countries. They're not just settling there, they're not just living there, they're actually contributing to society, they're becoming part of it. And I feel like that's a really important point to hone in. Um, but nevertheless, there do exist linguistic, cultural, and economic barriers that can hinder long-term employment for refugee women. Especially over the past year, decreasing public support for refugees. Um, there were a couple like polls I was looking at where like 64% of Americans don't think refugees should stay in America, and that can also affect um, employment rates for refugee women. Um, so, in light of all this, I think it's really important that we look at organizations that help support refugee women. And there was this one in Grace and Georgia that I really liked called Peace of Thread, also the pun on the puns. Um, so <laughs> it's, it employs refugee women by training and giving them a sewing machine so they can work from home. So it's something that can be taught, but also something that they can then you know, do on their own. Um, and I really like the quote um, that Denise Smith, who's a co-founder of it, when she says that our mission is to empower women to make a new life for themselves and their families by making purses, bags, and accessories. And so not only are they you know, really getting out of their home, becoming part of society, they also feel economically and materially secure because they're providing for themselves <laughs> and they're learning new skills and then they can continue, you know, continue doing that in the future, even if they're no longer employed by that company. And so having these sort of organizations, what it does is that it promotes cultural exchanges, it provides a platform for refugee women to improve their language skills, you know, especially women from Syria currently, you know, if they're like interacting with the women in the local community community, learning English, um, that can really help them in the long term. Um, and it, you know, it connects refugee women to women in the receiving community, which overall increases connections between the two groups. Um, okay. Thank you. So I'm back. <laughs> um, one of our classmates, Nana, could not be here, so I will be delivering her slides. So no credit to me if you learned anything, it's all her. <laughs> um, and we are going to be talking about education in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, so why education? Seems like a basic question, but um, it's still important to sort of go into it. One of the things that's important to note about the Democratic Republic of Congo, and I know we heard from it from one of our panelists this morning, who I don't think is here anymore, um, but a lot of the population in the DRC, the other DRC, is, um, <laughs> is what are called IDPs, or internally displaced people. So they're actually still in their own home country, um, but because of civil war, civil conflicts, extreme poverty, they are not able to sort of stay where their home base is. Um, so 
they're actually displaced within their own country. So a lot of the issues that we sort of been talking about with language barriers and things aren't as relevant, but there are other issues. One is that they just are not able to receive education aid because they're displaced. Like there's just, there is not the infrastructure for them. Um, it's sort of hard to play catch up if you're as a, you know, our panelist was talking about how, you know, over and over she would have to leave for weeks or months at a time. Um, so it's hard if you have to leave your home and you come back and you leave and you come back uh, to make up that lost time. Um, and then the children who never end up receiving that education, it made, that prevents them from going into sort of skilled trades, things like that, into livelihood, into different livelihoods. Um, and then they are, they become at greater risk of exploitation, you know, violent or sexual exploitation. So for the people who do have to move, language barriers are a huge issue when it comes to education and there's also sort of a debate you know if somebody leaves their home country and is going to be resettled in a new country should they be taught in their home language or should they be taught in that new language so that they're better able to integrate and that's not something that people really have a clear answer on so that's a problem in and of itself um, if they are in internment camps there's just no resources if there are no resources schools are not always going to be the first thing you know if water diseases, food, if these are all issues, then schools are not going to be a priority. Um, and then if they don't have the, again, if they don't have the tools, the supplies, then there's just no way to teach children effectively. So we're just going to go through a bunch of different organizations that do, you know, good work supporting different um, schools in the DRC for IDPs in the country. So educate a child, um, they have, they work uh, with kids in the DRC and they're breaking barriers and they work in partnership with the International Refugee Commission Committee, International <laughs> Rescue Committee. Um, so they have a program called Enrolling Out of School Children and they work with about 30, 45,000 children, which is a good number. UNICEF and the UNHCR, we've heard from um, a UNHCR staff member today. So they don't have any specific programs, but they do partner with other NGOs to support them in their endeavors. And then War Child builds on the work of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, and they also run several programs for IDPs in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And Lorraine is going to come and wrap this up for us. Thank you. So through our presentation, we wanted to convey that empowerment for refugees through art, social networks, employment, and education all work towards um, a common goal, which is for these resilient and very strong women who have been forced into refugee, IDP, or asylum seeker status to regain control, um, confidence, and uh, a way to rebuild their lives. And thank you so much for staying and listening to our presentation. Just quickly go to your what the sources of your information. While you're briefly looking over the references, we just wanted to thank Professor Martin again for being an amazing professor all year long. It's truly been an honor for all of us to be in your class with all your amazing wisdom and personal experiences that you've been able to share with us. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. And we also want to thank our amazing TA, Anna. Please, please stand. <laughs> Anna put in countless hours to help organize this event as well and to manage all of us and our crazy schedules. Um, so we really, really thank you both for being such amazing, amazing women. Thank you.